my gosh. Brett. Yes. Brett Easton Ellis. Yes. Okay, so first I have to read an opener for the radio. Hello and welcome to tonight's program with Inforum at the Commonwealth Club. I'm Nellie Bowles, tech and culture journalist at the New York Times. And tonight, I'm excited to be in conversation with Brett Easton Ellis, author of novels including American Psycho and The Rules of Attraction, podcast host of The Brett Easton Ellis Show, and author of the new book and his first wor work of nonfiction, White. So, Brett. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I am the stereotype of the people you classify in your book as generation wuss. <clears throat> I'm a San Franciscan, I'm a gay, I eat organic, I go to yoga, I, I even write for the New York Times. I've done all of those things too. So, so I've done all of those things too. Make but. your cell to me. This book is about the problems, in large part, it's about the problems in my generation. Make your cell to me. What's wrong with my generation? I'm uh, sitting right here. Yes. I mean, part of the reason that I wanted to write this book is because for the last 10 years, I have been living with a member of your generation. <laughs> I've been living with Todd the Millennial, who I often talk about on my podcast and who I reference a lot in white. And it was kind of stunning to um, find myself having, we've now been together for 10 years, having this long-term relationship with someone who was from a different generation of mine. He was a millennial. Um, and just seeing the radical differences in bet uh, between how we each look at the world. And uh, it was, at first, shocking. I no longer really call him a wuss, or I use generation wuss. That was an initial kind of thing that I did. But I was really surprised by how much triggered him and how, how how angry he got about stuff and how hysterical. What was triggering him? What was he getting angry uh, He would be, and I talk about this in the book, our first real fight was about cyberbullying, which as a Gen Xer, I just couldn't wrap my head around it. We had a terrible fight about uh, that, that case that happened with Darm Ravi and um, uh, the kid from Rutgers who was a, who felt that he had been cyberbullied by his roommate who had set up a webcam and had uh, caught him making out with another guy. The kid got very embarrassed by it and then jumped off a bridge. I couldn't process that. I couldn't understand the level of shame that would cause someone over what I thought was a pretty innocuous dorm room prank to actually go to that place. My boyfriend kind of understood it and he's, in terms of the amount of shame and cyberbullying that he saw on the internet. Um, and so to me, there was a, there was a wide array of, st of stuff that he was reacting to that I began to tweet about under the uh, label Generation Wuss Strikes Again, Generation Wuss Does That. It was, it was because of the title Generation Wuss, obviously jokey, but there was a truth in it. But I am in his shoes every day. Mm. We've been together 10 years. I completely understand what he's going through. I completely understand his anger. And his, and his overreaction to things, and so, and so I get it. If you had to sort of quickly sum up for the audience, some of whom have read the book, some of whom haven't, what, what's the problem? What's the problem you're going out to fix? Chill out. <laughs> it's chilling out, and it really is finding a way that's more cunning, more calm and collected in order to figure out and to dismantle your enemies and your demons and to actually freak out 24-7, aided by social media, aided by the 24-7 cable networks, or whatever you're watching. Uh, my boyfriend really, in the last two weeks, has moved away from MSNBC and various mainstream, mainstream media uh, outlets, uh, and is now only getting his news from various YouTube outlets. But and, 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 and I just saw for, I, I have seen for about two and a half, three years, what I feel, and again, I'm coming from a different generation, and what I feel is an overreaction to things that doesn't really move the needle, that the overreaction doesn't move the needle, that there is a way to, you know, as I said before, in, in a very cunning, collected way, you go about the problem, you circumvent it, and you make sure it stops. And I think sometimes that he gets so over-emotional, as do many of his friends, that instead of solving the problem or dealing with the problem or eradicating the problem, 
the problem subsumes them. Mm. And that is the problem. But why shouldn't it? Why shouldn't we uh, be subsumed by problems or be angry? I think, I, like, like, you talk a lot in the book about um, how, we should, um, how we should be calm, how we should not get into the muck of fights and how people shouldn't be too angry. But uh, the reason you and I are able to sit up here to out gay people is because there were big fights. People got really angry. People fought. Yes. Got outraged. If there had been Twitter, they'd be tweeting. Yes. And there is a resistance. And that resistance is a good thing. But the resistance can only move the needle so far unless it really steps away from the problem, doesn't let the problem subsume them, sees the whole picture, the totality, which I think might finally now be happening in the overall culture for whatever reasons in the last couple of weeks, <clears throat> and then tackle the problem. What I've seen, though, is an outrage that is so outraged that it blinds people to dealing with the problems that they can like face and then dismantle and then deal with and then move on. It's kind of a stasis, you know, and that is what has always worried me about Todd, is that the anger and the over... Uh, you or know, Todd. Todd. No, Todd is probably <laughs> live streaming this somewhere and he's probably... <laughs> He's 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 probably fine with it, but um no, and also I, we talk about this all the time. At some point, I want to ask your relationship relationship advice, but that's for later, later and, in the conversation. And it also doesn't suggest I don't believe in protest. I do believe in protest, okay. and I do believe in resistance. But I am just of a generation, I guess, that thinks that the needle needs to be here and not like way over here. Uh, that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, and and of course Todd doesn't agree with that. And of course, Todd is unhappy, and I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> how do you guys just, to, and then we'll move on from Todd. Todd, um, how do you guys negotiate that in the home? Exactly. Because our relationship is 90% about other things. And it's about just caring for each other and enjoying each other's company. It's not necessarily about um, world events, politics. And even if it is, that doesn't subsume what we like about each other and if we have differences. And we actually, though I know the book makes it look that, that way, and sometimes I talk about it on the podcast, we're actually a little bit closer than it sounds in white and also on the podcast. I am really not someone aligned with anyone. I am a cool, ironic Gen Xer, and I always have been. He is an overreactive millennial, and so we're in a kind of bad okay. sitcom. At one point you call him like a, a, you say he is marching around the living room like a Russian, like an angry Russian peasant. Um, you, like, oh, screaming Russian peasant. It's does, like, it's... It, does it, he it, respond well to that? Um, well, he's not responding well to anything, so I mean... <laughs> It really is. It is like a bad Norman Lear sitcom. Crusty old Gen Xer is stomping around while having to deal with crazy democratic, socialist, millennial, you know, kid. But, um, we, but, we, but that is not the basis of our relationship. Our basis is not only that. There's fun to be had in other areas. And, we, and, our, and our days are not all always locked into an ideological battle about whatever's going on in the world. Um, you know, I am someone who really doesn't say a lot. Todd is, if any fights happen, it's Todd is extremely angry about something. Very hysterical. <laughs> and it grates on me a little bit. I said, just calm down. Just, just like, how can you calm down? How can you calm down when this is happening? I said, well, you know, we'll go for a walk or whatever. I mean, what are you, what are you going to do? And then it escalates into me being an uncaring Gen Xer who doesn't give a shit about anything. And then, and then it kind of ends. And then it kind of lands in a place where um, we decide to get a pizza, go to a movie or something. It doesn't subsume everything. Yeah. Finally, I get them down to a place where it's okay. And that's how it works. And ideology should not uh, define your relationship. You talk a lot about, in your book, the difference between real life and Twitter. That, that there's real life and, and, and Twitter really is a totally separate. Not real separate. life at all. No, it's fake yeah. life. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about how things are just a tweet. Everyone's taking the tweet too seriously. It's right. all, yeah. yeah. Um, but your book 
takes Twitter and tweets very seriously. Like there's a whole chapter called tweeting and there there's, is. I mean, like it, it, um, it, it's sort of the <laughs> nexus, the, the, the crux of the book. It's the whole center is about tweeting and tweet culture and <laughs> tweets you don't like and, um, and tweets you've tweeted. It um, is. It seems like Twitter matters a great deal to you. So where am I getting this wrong? Where, where, I, what's the difference here? I think you're getting it wrong in terms of thinking that it bothers me so much. What that Twitter chapter does, I think is a very calm breakdown of how I use Twitter, my Twitter controversies, and why I don't use Twitter anymore, and why Twitter used to be at one point fun and then turned into something that was kind of a trap. And that's what I hope that section was. It really, you know, Look, just, can I pause you for one second? Yeah. Just for the Twitter controversies, um, this was the one that that really got was the most controversial, probably initially, and, and that got you back on my radar as sort of a modern yes person in the com- Twitter conversation. Would be um, would be the tweet: um, Catherine Bigelow would be considered a mildly interesting filmmaker if she was a man, but since she's a very hot woman, she's really overrated. I tweeted that. <laughs> I own it, I, but I also discuss why that tweet occurred and what I was thinking about at the time and how Twitter gets things wrong. What that tweet was really about was how I did feel that the, the town, Hollywood, and the media seemed to be overrating Bigelow with Zero Dark Thirty, which was a movie a lot of people had some problems with because of torture and stuff, but a lot of people seemed to look the other way because it was representative of something, which was actually a good thing. It was a good thing to be representative, to have a, you know, a woman in Hollywood. But is it really across the boards good? And should the work be looked at rather than just the representation? Now, of course, Twitter has no context. And of course, m- me saying that now doesn't change the fact of that quote, and of that tweet. But um, it was the beginning of realizing that using Twitter to try to make Um, complex, uh, especially when I was using it a lot to talk about movies and filmmakers, really doesn't work when you're trying to uh, not only say something, but be a little bit outrageous and be a little bit of a troll, which what Twitter was then, and people went with it, and then this was at the cusp, I think, of when people were no longer going with it. This was kind of the break, and it was kind of the break for me as well. You liked it, though, at the time. You liked being... A troll, and this wasn't that long ago. You, you wrote like now in your, in your book. Now I was trolling, and my desire was to, was to have a good time, to be a provocative, somewhat outrageous, and opinionated critic, to be a bad boy, a douche, all in 140 characters or less. You cut pleasure out of it for four and a half minutes. <laughs> it would last about three minutes to four minutes, <laughs> and you'd have your glass of Chardonnay or your glass of tequila by your keyboard at 11:38. And you'd be typing these things, and suddenly, oh, I'm going to say this. And then you said it, and then boom, 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 ah, and then it stopped. And I was like, oh, what am I going to do? Who's on Nightline or whatever? I mean, that was kind of how, how it worked for me. But it was also the notion of taking tweets, and that's what this section of the book is about, seriously. That Twitter is a fake world, is a performative world, and the fact that people would get angry about tweets and cancel people about tweets, and that tweets seem to, you know, sum up the humanity of a person, seemed ridiculous to me, and still does seem ridiculous to me. I mean, it's crazy. A cheeky, inoffensive, or, or offensive tweet, suddenly, uh, people seem to, like, get that person his entire 55 years, I don't know. I just have a hard time buying that. I, I don't want to d- d- dwell too much in this because I can like debate Twitter. I, I, I think that the me- why does the media matter so much? It's still words. It's language. You said a thing. Like it doesn't like that. It's a tweet. It's like when when uh, Trump's tweets early on, everyone was like, well, it's just a tweet. And now it's like, no, these are presidential proclamations. They should they ought to be covered as news. Like, wh- why does the form make it all of a sudden not? My, but I'm. I'm Digressing too much. Okay, but anyway, and, we'll, and, we, and we will wrap it up very quickly in terms about the tweets. My tweets are uh, very different from Donald Trump's tweets. <laughs> they're not like, I have a very, they're very, very different. And I really don't tweet that much, and I don't tweet national policy. And I don't tweet about, my tweets were basically about like movies and directors. <laughs> and um, they were kind of like supposed to be funny. Sometimes, some, look, 
The New York Times called my Twitter feed brilliant in the summer of 2013 in an article talking about why my Twitter feed was great. So I, I mean, I, it, that's there, they said it, but um, I don't know if I believe check that. My editors, I, mean, I, I don't know if I believe that. <laughs> it was August 2013. <laughs> because I was shocked to see that in this article about the canyons. But anyway, um, so I don't know. I mean, I, each person uses it differently, and I really don't use it that much anymore. Yeah. I use it to promote the podcast, and actually Facebook is a better way to promote the podcast, and sometimes I'll throw in uh, a tweet about a movie I liked or something like that, but I, I am not uh, big on Twitter at all anymore, though I do, it, my news feed is on it, so I yeah. do wake up, and I, it's a very easy way to, to have your news, to, to look at your news feed and check out what's going on. Um, the the movie thing is actually a good segue because um, you also in your book write a ton about movies. You have it's really movie criticism is a central theme throughout the book, and and your argument. Tell me if I'm wrong, but your argument seems to be that that critics are sort of sheep like in how they all um, go in one direction or another. So tell me, tell us, what movies do you think? critics got wrong? What, what movies were good in the last few years that critics missed? You'd be a movie critic right now. Well, as Todd says about white, Todd says, stay for the movie criticism, stay for the cultural criticism, stay for Brett's childhood, stay for his uh, writing American Psycho in his 20s, and then leave for anything dealing at all remotely with the media and political coverage. Yeah. So he likes that part of the book that you're that's talking about right Todd, now. Todd's a good. Todd's that's, a smart yeah. guy. I know. Um, movie. You know. Yeah. There is. And I wish there was more movie criticism in this book. And maybe the next book I will use a lot more of the stuff that I talk about it on my seems podcast. Seems like that's kind of what you want to do. Yeah. Rather than have people attack me for thinking this book is a political book and that it's about Trump, which it is not. But, oh, I but did, uh, you do write a lot about politics in that. Right. But I did, for things that my editor just didn't want in this book, and I kind of fought him on, I wanted a much longer uh, section about uh, the movies of Brian De Palma. I wanted to keep a section about William Freakin's Cruising, which I think needs a major new reappraisal right now. And But my editor was thinking that this really wasn't that book, that this was about this moment and how you arrived at this place you were at by dealing with your childhood, by dealing with your 20s, by dealing with this kind of whatever your awakening was and then landing at this place, and all that stuff was digressive. What's a movie recently that I really like that critics miss? Look, it's going to be controversial, but I do think Green Book is one of those uh one of those movies and I critics do, missed it at one best picture uh, yeah and the critics you should see Manila Dargis on Oscar night saying disgusting how did this happen when she was tweeting about it that but movie was one more place it's in New York uh, uh, Justin lot. Chang and the LA Times had a breakdown too there there was and Wesley Morris famously yeah, sure. I love Wesley Morris but Wesley Morris wrote a brilliant piece about Green Book Two days before voters were going into the academy, that said this was a movie you cannot support, and he didn't and have, it convinced and them. And he didn't a very brilliant. Well, he didn't convince them. No, well, which, I mean, which proves that the people liked the movie a lot more than critics did, and that critics uh, used their ideology over the movie, uh, used their ideology to describe the movie rather than just enjoy the very real pleasantries of the film, which were really about craft writing about acting and production. And ultimately, I think one of the reasons why I know so many people who like that movie was that it was one of the only cultural artifacts from last year that really was about hope, that there was a sense of hope between the races, no matter how clumsy or corny you might have thought it was, but many, many people were moved by that notion. And a lot of critics rejected it because they didn't feel it was woke enough in the same way as Sorry to Bother You or Black Klansmen or Blind Spotting actually very negative movies about bringing people together and bringing white and black people together. Whereas Green Book, in its old-fashioned way, said there is a possibility. These men can exist and they can love each other. And as hokey as it might seem, I think a lot of people like that message and they wanted to see that. But the fact that you're citing the New York Times, you're citing some sort of blogs, and and 
the book, the, the movie still won Best Picture. I mean, there's a um, there's a whole landscape that I think in your book and now you're missing. I mean, it's not like the New York Times is the only publication out there anymore. Of course, and of like. Course. Uh, ben Shapiro's book is, you know, one of the top-selling books on Amazon. You know, the, of course, um, right. There's not sort of a media just, hegemony anymore. That right. I was just using that kind of as uh, as major examples in terms of, you know, the L.A. Times, the New York Times, or yeah. you know, two big papers and whatever. And, and and they do have, they do hold sway. I mean, people do care about them. I mean, it's not as if, you know, people ignore uh, what. Uh, and actually, these smart critics have to say, and I'm not saying that just because you're for the New York Times, but the New York Times does have smart film criticism, and so does, and so does now, uh, shockingly, the LA Times does with Justin Chang. So, LA Times has gotten really good. Um, why did you call the book White? The White Album by Joan Didion, if you want to believe that. The White Album by Joan Didion is my favorite book of essays. It has influenced me, uh, and it was one of the things that made me want to be a writer. Uh, that's just been a fact since 1979. Uh, I had never written a nonfiction book before, and uh, when my editor asked me to come up with, just come up with a uh, working title, so that when we pass the files back and forth, we have a, a working title. And I wanted something with white in the, the title that mimicked Joan Didion's The White Album, and I couldn't think of anything. And then I realized this book is really from the point of view, these essays, uh, this outlook is from the point of view of a white privileged male. And I thought, wouldn't it be funny to have white privileged male be the title of this book? And it was the title of the book for a few months before my editor shot it down and said, it's too jokey, it undercuts some of the things that you want to do, it's too wink wink. And so we removed uh, privileged male. And there was a consensus for that, and that white was kind of sweeping maybe ominous for some, but really for others, uh, this idea of blankness, neutrality, uh, and also a disappearing world, because when Chip Kidd did the cover, uh, if you see the hardcover, white is at the very top uh, of the book, and it's slowly disappearing. You can barely see it as it's floating up into the the ether or whatever. So I, I, I ended up getting... I, understood what everyone was talking about and how they wanted to call it this and how Chip wanted to design the book that way and also realizing that it could push some buttons, I suppose, but that's also what the book is arguing about. That, 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 that shouldn't push buttons. It shouldn't, but it will for some, not for all, it by any means. come on. You think it will for all people? <laughs> I, I know, I'm curious. Does it? Does it? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. But if it does push buttons, then I do think that that, that is a problem. I don't think it should push a button. I don't think that word should push a button. You don't think that the book should? Uh, I don't think that word should um, necessarily push that particular button and make people like freak out that the book is called white. Why did you want... Because it really is not about race. And I think people, if, you know, if people were... Oh, I would were, say the book has a lot of elements that are about race. Well, I don't think alt-right people are going to want to read this book or like are going to want to well, read about me like jerking off over Richard Gere or like... <laughs> Talking about my love of Joan Didion and like, you know, tra traipsing around the valley as a little boy going to Brian De Palma movies. I, I, I think the book is much, much more over there than it is at times here. That seems to overshadow the book for me. And so when I hear someone say it's a political book, I'm going, it wasn't a political book. I wasn't thinking that at all when I was writing. I was thinking about me looking and covering something, but not aligning myself with policy and not defending people and not saying, oh, this is how it has to be. It, it really is a reaction. The entire book is a reaction toward a kind of entitled hysteria is how I saw it. And that, I don't know where that's going to work. I don't know where the end game of that is. And that kind of worried me. Why did you want privileged male in the title? What, what, what do those words mean to you now? What, what, what would a kind that... of a joke, kind of a joke. What, Another kind of thing, like joke. old white man, like whatever. I was at, um, I was at the LA Book Festival, and um, I don't know if anyone in this audience has ever had to do C-SPAN before in front of a festival and get phone calls. 
And I, I don't think I'd ever had to do it before, but what happens is that, you know, you get very elderly people calling in, and someone says, I don't understand this title, White. I don't know what's going on. And he said, you look like you're from, he was talking about the host, you look like you're from Norwegian ascent, and, some, and Mr. Ellis looks like quite ruddy, like he's from Scotland, and I don't, <laughs> I don't really understand what this whole White business is about. No question. And then sort of like they go into the next caller and then the next caller was going, I don't know what that gentleman meant when he talked about Mr. Ellis's skin tone. And I don't understand why he's so upset over how you look. And then finally, the, uh, the f final question was, um, Mr. Ellis, I am an old white man and I don't like being called an old white man. I really resent being called an old white man. What do you think? And then the commentator looked at me and said, do you think it's racist? And I said, well, you know, I think it's a kind of a joke, and if you can't laugh about it, and you can't find it funny, and you're going to trip it up into something else, if you're going to take it so seriously, then you probably deserve the feelings that you're, that you're having about that. I really do. I mean, if you're really going to be wringing your hands all day, worried that you're being called an old white man, I, I can't help you. I mean, I don't know what to, what to say. But white privileged male seems to be like another one of those things that is, you know, sure, White privileged male. I mean, uh, what do you think it means? What do you think? What do you think the whole the the the, the how that's used? I mean, it's not positive. It's used in evolving and complex ways. Yes, and I agree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, the are you still going to take me out for a drink? <laughs> There's wine in back. The um, come on, okay. This this it's not a political book. It is a political book. Okay, how is it a okay? Because it's all fair enough. Fair enough. Go ahead, all, I want to hear it. Because it's all about politics and this idea that it's not about race. It, I it race is a theme through the whole book. Um, you, I mean, I. I I know you've been questioned about this a bunch on your press tour already with Isaac Chotner and, and other interviews, yes. but you reserve a lot of your, um, you know, mo your greatest frustration, your greatest anger at different um, media has, seems to be about um, things that have been real touchstones in the black American community. The, the Black Panther, um, Selma, um, th these are movies that really trigger you. I like genre movies, and I've made this the foundation of my criticism. I like musicals, I like horror movies, I like mysteries, I like bank heists. I don't like ideological movies at all. I don't like message movies. They're a real problem to me. They don't. They seem to be uh, a reaction against the pleasure but of film. Every movie is a message movie. Every movie uh, has an ideology. Well, nothing some, is apolitical. Some have more than others, certainly, and certainly Selma has more than Carrie. I mean, you know, you. <laughs> I mean, you you can't ignore that. They can't all be the same. Not every movie is the same politically. I mean, that's the problem with that with the New Yorker piece when he asked me, well, you, you say in an interview that you find sexual assault totally abhorrent, and yet how can you approve, if I even do, that there's someone in, uh, uh, who's president who grabbed someone's, who bragged that he grabbed someone's pussy? I don't know. I mean, you, we can live in a world where you think sexual assault and, and that is the same, but you're, you're implying that all movies are political and therefore what? There's a problem in queer cinema, in feminist cinema, and in black cinema, ideology reigns. And it's a bummer to me. I don't like those kind of movies. I think the first half of Black Klansman is great. It's a terrific cop picture, interesting setup. He's got to infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan. And then the movie becomes, I think, labored about its ideology. I think the same thing is true with Selma. And I think it's true with a lot of black themed films and for a lot of queer themed films. And I'm just not particularly interested in that. And so that is why those movies get 
uh, critiqued by me more often than not. My favorite TV show is Atlanta, and I talk about it on my podcast all the time because it takes the two things. It takes ideology, and it takes its very, very brilliant aesthetics and ties them together, and that's where the meaning of the show is. It's not just people complaining. It's not just this kind of aggravating, uh, victimized ideology. It's art, and that's what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for that ideology. So if I get that, that slam about black films, and I get it from the gay community too, because I do slam a lot of you know, gay movies that have you know, the message about everything and the victimization. Uh, that's, I think, what you've noticed. Mm. Do you think that the media tour, do, do you think um, Isaac's interview or any of these things, do you think it's been, what, what do you make of it? It proves my point exactly. It proves everything I write about in the last chapter of this book about the hysterical reaction to people exactly. There is no more perfect example than that New Yorker piece or for that book forum interview <clears throat> by the young transgender woman who wrote it. Um, they were so massively triggered by this, so made so hysteric by this, that they kind of lost, I feel, um, their sense of purpose and their sense of being able to look at something calmly and then break it down. Um, I don't know. This, was, this is talked about over and over and over in the last chapter of this book, and those just were like A-level examples of proving me right. Now, I mean, triggering millennials like this is kind of delicious. I mean, it's like eating frosting. I mean, I have to say that I can't believe I'm able to do this in such a way <clears throat> where people get <clears throat> go so overboard and so overreact to this book or to me um, is uh, interesting. And I, uh, I don't know. Excuse me while I'm just triggered over here for a minute. Um, <laughs> I find your answer about the, the race question a little bit disingenuous because it it like who are you to decide what's art and what's not art? Some this is art and that's it's. Uh. Of course, I'm allowed to decide. Of course, I'm a writer. I'm a critic. Yeah. Like, well, oh, of I know. course, I'm allowed to decide. I, I can't believe that you're thinking that I'm not allowed to decide that. I don't yeah. know what that side is. I don't understand how you can think that that is. The problem. When you were young. Yes. When I was young. <laughs> when you were, let's I, say, I noted, like, when I noted you were, like, closer to my age, let's say. <laughs> um, you were part of the Brat Pack, which was, like, a notorious, sort of famous New York young people scene. Everyone was watching you guys. Everyone was criticizing. Everyone was, like, obsessing on and, and, uh, and was snarky towards you guys. Does it feel weird now to be on the other side of that mirror and to be looking at the youth and being like, whoa. I remember when I wrote Less Than Zero that I felt like that old man on the porch shaking my fist at my contemporaries. And I felt that I was being very judgmental about those kids and what they were, <clears throat> what they were up to. <clears throat> and that took me back to being a kindergartner and judging my peers. It's my, it's my aesthetic in a way. And it's throughout all my books. It's throughout all the books. It's in Rules of Attraction and Glamorama. And there's this kind of outsider judgmental quality. But I do think that what saves the books is that I implicate myself. Ultimately, I implicate myself. So I don't know, you know, people keep asking me like, well, don't you care what young people are saying about you today? No. I don't care what young people are saying about me today. And I never have cared what young people are saying about me. Uh, and that goes back to, uh, you know, the first book. But, um, so no, it's not weird at all. And I never experienced the Brat Pack in that way. Uh, it was kind of a, <clears throat> it always felt like a made-up thing. We barely hung out together. It was something the media made up because it was easier to deal with Tama Janowitz and me and Jay McInerney. 
as a thing rather than three separate writers who really were t uh, temperamentally quite different from each other. I mean, you write about the Brat Pack in the book and being part of it and the Knights and the Coke and the this and the that. Right. No, I do. And I, and I write about it. Well, I write about, it's not necessarily the Brat Pack. I write about the writing of American Psycho. And those were the years that I became associated with the Brat Pack in 1987 and through 1989. What, and, we've got audience. I've got a great stack of audience questions. Let's go for them. Um, what percentage of your commentary should we take as genuine and what percent as shock jock tactics? <laughs> okay, I would say 100% genuine. I know some people look at them as shock jock. I understand that. You're on one side of the aisle. But I don't say anything that I feel is uh, to be a shock jock. And I don't feel that's what the podcast is. I wouldn't waste my time wanting to be a shock jock. Though some people think I am. But I think they're on a different side of the room. Who's your favorite person you interviewed for your podcast? And who are you dying to book? Um, oh, uh, well... I did a recent podcast with a young journalist named Lily Analeek, who has this book out about Eve Babbitts, who's a kind of faded L.A. writer. And uh, we just did this huge deep dive with like an hour on Joan Didion, which was pure heaven and very gossipy about Joan Didion. And there's a lot of stuff in her books about Joan that is, uh, that, that's uh, quite interesting. Uh, my favorite, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have a favorite one. Uh, um, I like doing the one with Rose McGowan, definitely. I actually have to tell you, Karen Kusama, who directed a movie called The Invitation in 2016, uh, which was my favorite movie that year, was absolutely brilliant on my podcast. And I would have to say that year, Karen Kusama was... Uh, because she was so brilliant about 70s films, and we just had these reference points that we could bounce off o over and over again for two hours. Is there anyone you wouldn't interview? Um, uh, no, uh, you know, actors are hard. Actors mm. are hard. And yeah. I found that out. Um, but, um, that makes sense. but no, I don't think so. I, I would always give everyone a shot. Someone here and don't answer this. Someone here. What, what do you think about the movie Moonlight? I see that as a troll, but that's okay. Because there's a, there is a chapter about Moonlight in the book, and I kind of take a deep dive into it. That is from the podcast. I actually did a very interesting podcast with um, an actress who got blacklisted for being gay, who was, uh, who was starred in a movie with Harrison Ford in the late... Uh, this is the Moonlight podcast. This was on the Moonlight yeah. podcast. And so and, but Moonlight generally, your thoughts on the Moonlight are you don't like it. Oh, we're okay. They're okay. I think it was overrated. That's all. Oh, gasps. Gasps. I said Moonlight's overrated. Oh, my God. Uh, really? That's the problem. See, saying that and getting that reaction, that self-seriousness about Moonlight is part of the problem, I think. So I don't know. You can't say anything about Moonlight, you know, is part of the problem, I think. You can't say something negative about Moonlight. You have to love it. You have to love it. Many people don't. <laughs> it's just the, it's the pattern of the movies that you pattern. single out for not it's a liking. Pattern. It's, yes, a pattern. it's a pattern. It is a pattern. There is a pattern because I have an aesthetic. I have an aesthetic. And it happens to be one that doesn't align itself with ideology. And that is interested in aesthetics. That's the pattern. I Thank you. The, Thank you. Is it so the, hard to understand? Like you have to like everything that's black themed or from a female point of view or a gay point of view or a victimized white guy. I mean, you don't. I mean, you Why can... do you use the word aesthetic there? Uh, well, how did I use it? How, how did I use that, it? That it's an aesthetic and so that's why. An aesthetic to me seems devoid of ideology. It's about the style. It's all about the style. And without style, there really isn't anything. Without style, there really is not any meaning. You have to have a, a style. Style has to override ideology. For me, not for you. For me. That's what I like. And just because it's not what I like doesn't mean you can't like it yourself. I've got a question that says, 
How do we remain enthusiastic about the values and beliefs we hold as important without sacrificing our relationships with those who have different values and beliefs? Is it possible to have discourse that rele relieves our own existential questions? <laughs> okay, that one, that one took a turn. I I'm think dead. They, it's I think, over. I just <laughs> self-suicided. I'm not... I, <laughs> what is that person okay, I think, saying? I think maybe does someone, that one, does someone want, want to stand want, up? They want a Who tip. wrote that? They want a tip for for That's dinners. a troll. <laughs> the moonlight question was <laughs> innocuous. <laughs> they want a tip for surviving dinner with those they disagree with. What's that again? Oh, they, I think they want a tip for okay. surviving dinner with those they disagree oh, with. Oh, yes. Surviving dinner. I mean, I don't know. Again, the hysteria is all over the place. I can't survive dinner if he doesn't like moonlight. I mean, really, <laughs> where are we? Where are we? Sometimes I think I'm going mad when I hear young people talk about shit like this. It's like, really? This is how you live your life? It must be so hard, so difficult. And that's why they're so unhappy. That's why they're so miserable. All of them. Miserable. Because of things like this. Because of that kind of thinking. Okay. <laughs> Nellie? Building, building off that, do you have any advice for those of us who are irritated with the average mob being outraged without getting outraged ourselves? Your New York Times interview tried to attack you and you handled it beautifully. I think this refers to not this. This refers to your New York Times profile, I hope. Yeah. What was the, qu what was the question? <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. Advice for those who are irritated with the average, advice for those who are no being advice for anybody, but mobbed and they're, but they're not outraged mobbed. themselves. How, how do they, how do you? Like getting mobbed and then not caring about the mob? Or, or watching mobs? I'm not sure. We mobs can are terrible, it. whatever. They're not real either. I mean, it's kind of like I've gotten mobbed many times. I've gotten, you know, troll attacks on Twitter. You know, it goes away. It's just, it doesn't, it's not real. It's like um, you can't take it seriously and you certainly can't react to it. That's a real problem. That just lights the bonfire up. If you were going to write another work of fiction, what would it be about? Um, you know, um, I don't know. I, honestly, I think it would be more genre-based. I don't know. Uh, and I do look at most of my books as genre-based. And, and their ideology is melded into the aesthetic. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I was interested in the novel during the years that I wrote them as a way of communicating ideas I had about the world to a, a readership. I didn't have a huge readership, but I had a readership, and I really thought that the novel was uh, a way to send messages about uh, style and information, like, uh, you know, less than zero. Many people read that book, and they had never seen L.A. portrayed that way. Now, that's not why I wrote the book, but there was a connection between the novelist and the reader that their books were, were almost like messages from the front. And I think that that helped me get excited about novels in a way where I don't see them working that way anymore. Though, of course, there are books like, you know, uh, Tommy Orange is there, there. It's a terrific novel uh, about uh, Native American life here in, I think, Oakland that showed me a world that I had never seen before. And that book has sold a lot of copies, a lot for a hardcover book. But I just don't hear the conversation about it. It's kind of like not there with the intelligentsia where it once was. And I miss having those conversations about books. And maybe that translates into me not wanting to really write fiction that much. Um, you but you started this book wanting to write a novel. That's how it opened. Uh, because this was more, more interesting to me than writing a novel. I didn't, I, look, you know, I also think I've written like six novels. I think that's a lot. I know, it's, I know maybe you guys don't, but like six novels, some of them are quite long. And it's like, <laughs> it took me a long time to write. I really, and, and I also have been wanting to get into film and television and get into long form series and getting into, uh, into that. And that has uh, taken up a lot of my time. Mm. If the if Bateman if the lead of American Psycho w were sort of alive today, if you were writing that set set today, you've said in the past that he would be in Silicon Valley. 
I did. I did say that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I said it one night. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. You, I, you yes. I mean, I, I really didn't explore it. Uh, in a grand way, but certainly the silicon. I mean, I mean, uh, the 1980s Wall Street guys look like just such a tiny little fish compared to, you know, what happened in Silicon Valley. And there's so much more money to be made, and so much more, um, you know, uh, I guess interesting. I, I don't know. Do I really want now at this point uh, in the world? Do I want to read? Will I commit myself to not only write a 400-page novel about? how ridiculous Silicon Valley is when we have Silicon Valley on HBO. Um, and what, what, would I actually expect a large readership who would like plunk down 25 bucks to read that book? I, I, I don't know. I have my doubts about that. I don't know. I feel, I feel sad sometimes about how disengaged people are from the literary novel. But they've, then, so the podcast is sort of where? In a way, yeah, the podcast is. Yeah, the podcast is. What part do you see culture playing in someone's sense of shame? How do you recommend someone moving past their cultural identity and sense of normality within their society? What are your thoughts on sort of shame? Is that useful? Because that's what a lot of this sort of online mobbing, this kind of idea is the idea that cultures set their own boundaries, that, they're, that they use shame to police behavior that might not be illegal, but that's not wanted. I hate that culture. I hate that culture. I don't believe in shame. All of this That's thing how humans a, like create. No, um, I guess, but it suggests that I care enough about that, or that this construct is matters to me. I don't know. I mean, uh, I hear that, and I think, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, I, I don't know. Oh God, an ominous silence. <laughs> an ominous silence. Okay. We have a good one actually here. How was the overreaction to American Psycho different from today's conversation? So like in your book, American Psycho gets bought by Simon Schuster. Yes. And then they, it's printed, right? Or it's about to be printed and then they cancel it. There are galleys. Because, because there is, uh, people are quote, offended. Yes. So maybe what's happening today with offense is no different from then. I mean, it seems. They're both dumb. I think they're both dumb when it comes to uh, books and especially something like uh, like American Psycho, uh, which um, which part of different? the problem was that it was it was a corporate decision, and that's what was scary about it. It wasn't made by the publishing house. The corporation that owned the publishing house hated the pre-publication bad publicity of that book. But I mean, like people were offended and riled up then about content that triggered them, and people are offended and riled up now about content that. Tri- that triggers them. Maybe it's just sort of like, this is... I don't know. I mean, I genuinely think that American Psycho is trigger-worthy, and a lot of the stuff now is not. Okay. In, a lo- in a lot of ways, so I the think... the bar for trigger has gotten it's lower. It's really gotten low. Okay. I can see why you would get hysterical somewhat about American Psycho if you read it in a particular way and it triggered you. But then again, you have to, I have to say, and, and as well as you know this, that there are many feminists I know who found the book hilarious, including Mary Heron and Guinevere Turner and Faye Weldon, who was one of the first women to come out and said, look, guys, this is freaking funny. This character is absurd. The whole world is absurd. Uh, you know, it, so I don't know. I mean, I just can't really get it up, I have to say caring what other people think. And I am far less interested in shame than my boyfriend is, who is consumed by shame on a daily basis, every time he goes online. He comes into my office, his head down, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed of that video I posted in 2016. I'm ashamed of the fact that I tweeted, orange juice is orange, from 2011. That, by the way, <laughs> the mob that went after me after the New Yorker thing appeared and I was trending, then moved on to who is Ellis's boyfriend, and then womp, went on and found all of Todd's old tweets. And, like, and then he made I'm these like. I'm so worried about Todd made, right now. No, he's fine. And he made, he made these like, like kind of, he was a musician, he made these kind of funny, earnest videos from like 2010, and he's like walking down the street and just people were just saying terrible things like, this is who Brett Easton Ellis is with? This is his boyfriend? I mean, hardcore, but 
I, for some reason, don't feel shame about that. I'm at a, I don't know if it's, it must be a generational thing. He feels heavy shame. I don't feel shame about anything. I don't feel any embarrassment about anything going on with the publication of this book, especially compared to 1990 and 1991. I think Todd is embarrassed and feels shame about everything. Is there any use for shame? Like, is shame ever useful? In... For an artist, no. Well, for a no, writer, but no. For a society. Oh, society is so messed up. It's so crazy. It's so full of nutcases and so many insane people. Why should I even worry about that to a degree in terms of... But in terms of an artist, in terms of a writer, shame is a terrible thing. As is, you know, you know there's that line in, um, that I talk about in The End of the Tour, the movie about David Foster Wallace, where this rewritten construct of David Foster Wallace is this very earnest, schlubby nice guy, dog-loving, McDonald's-eating, uh, tells, the, tells the smart New York journalist who's been humbled by him by the end of the movie because he realizes, yeah, I'm a New York journalist. I must be a bit of a dick. And he's kind of, in their last scene together, David Foster Wallace says, just be a good guy. Just be a good guy. And that is very terrible advice for a writer. That's really bad advice for a writer. And, that, and you can deal with that however you want. This, I, um, this might bridge off that. I don't know if I'm even allowed to read this question, but they gave it to me, so I, so I will. Um, which character from your books would you marry, have sex with, or kill? I think it's not have sex with. <laughs> it's the fuck. shame it's that fuck. I've internalized. Okay, okay, let's... I mean, really, if anyone is interested... If anyone is interested, I'll ask this. Okay, so what's who are the who's what's the first one? Marry, fuck, or kill. Who's the one that I would marry? Uh, it's going to get me in trouble. Okay, Sean Bateman. <laughs> hot, <laughs> very hot. Based on a very hot person, but Sean Bateman definitely he would. He, Drive me crazy, but that would be You're it. You're blushing a little right now. Is it hot in here? <laughs> Is it hot in here? I've been sweating all day, but... Oh, wait, what's the next one? Oh, fuck. Um, uh, Victor Ward who is the narrator of a very unread book of mine called Glamorama. He happens to be a male model, so... So that, and then... The, the, and then kill. And then and kill? Oh, uh, this, you know, you ask me this, it's going to get so weirdly heavy. I would kill the clay from Imperial Bedrooms, who turned out to be such a friggin' mess, such a disaster. Mm. And that's very depressing to realize that. Yeah, God. I'm not even kidding you. Look at the, what the next question on the little cards is. Uh, yes, I it's, am. It's, are you happy? You yeah. guys, you guys, this is getting intense. Are you happy? But I think they're asking that because they Where think that they? I might not be. <laughs> well, I think we're all worried about Todd. Oh, Todd! Is, Todd's I'm bounce not worried back. About you. Todd's bounce back time is huge. He could be super miserable, and then suddenly he's playing no, 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 Final go back Fantasy. To you. I'm sorry, I got us distracted. You got to answer it. There what did I answer? I am. I'm happy. You're happy. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm happy. Yeah, I'm happy. There's no other way to be. There's no other way to really move through the world. I finally realized after being miserable my whole life that there is the only way <laughs> to really make it work. It's kind of like, yeah, to kind of be happy, you know, or fake it a little bit. There, but, you know, sure. I mean, I don't let the miseries of the world overtake me in a way that, that, that I once, once had because I, I don't know where that gets me as a, as a writer or as an artist. We've been circling this a little bit. For someone who says, chill out, you choose, to make, you choose to publicly make comments you know folks will see as provocative. Why? So kind of, you're saying everyone should be calm, everyone should be chill, but you're really throwing a grenade into the, into the conversation you're trying to. A and grenade? <laughs> Did I throw a grenade into the conversation? Or, you know, you're trying to stir shit up. You know I am you trying are. To Don't stir pretend like you're I'm not. I'm not trying to stir anything up. I think one side thinks someone's trying to stir shit up, and one side isn't doing that. I'm not lobbing grenades and stirring a pot of shit up. I'm just saying what I feel. I'm not making things up. I'm talking honestly about 
where I'm at as an individual and how I see the world. That's all I'm doing. And I, I'm the type of person who would admit it if I stirred shit up or I was just trying to like fuck with people. I, I just, that is a waste of time. You can't do that. And it doesn't work really. It might work for a minute or two, but it doesn't sustain a career. It doesn't sustain an individual's authenticity or whatever. You have to just be, you have to be real. And that all suggests that I'm not being real, being a shit stir or throwing a grenade. That, that's not real, I don't think. So. But in terms of like making it work, so you argue to chill out, you argue to calm down, uh, you didn't vote, um, mm. you sort of argue for an apathy. Uh, argue for what? An apathy of sorts. There is something it's very attractive about apathy in this clearly, world. Clearly, there is something clearly, extremely. But that's not how. Uh, if we all just sat down and let, I mean, believe me, we have plenty of crazies to not ever let that happen. Okay, <laughs> so don't ever worry about that. That apathy thing isn't going to happen. There's a, enough nutcases out there to keep like, everything churning and going on like crazy. It's a very Gen so X. You're trait. just going to leave it to the nutcases. Well, I don't know. I mean, who, who, I mean, what else are you supposed to do, After really? I mean, as I think, no, look, I'm not a true. I, look, I write. I'm here. I can't be truly apathetic if I'm not here trying to engage with you. And I'm talking to people, and I'm on a book tour, and I've written a book. So the apathy thing is mm, not not really right. But there definitely is an a distance and a cool and an ironic distance from Gen X, and I see it in a lot of my friends who are my age and who have similar similar beliefs in terms of that. It's not it's not like, a total like blaming all out 90s check-out. skateboard culture. <laughs> uh, is that Gen X? No. What is Gen X? I only know actually from 2010 onwards. Gen X. Oh. <laughs> so sorry. I'm so sorry. That's, no, that's that's true. No, Gen X is whatever ma- the made-up generation after Boomer and before Millennial. <laughs> but uh, so after Trump won, uh, and you're writing about sort of people freaking out, and you you wrote there were no signs of accepting one of life's simple if brutal truths. You win some, you lose some, and then you write you write it's not as though a, a Quote, a bureaucratic band-aid is going to heal the deep, contradictory rifts and the cruelty, the passion and fraudulence that factor into what it means to be human. And this is what you read as sort of like, we, we should all, like, uh, politics aren't going to fix it. But on a certain level, some things matter. Like, uh, we keep talking about the gay thing, so let's talk about that. Like, it, it matters on a tangible level whether I can get married next year or not. Like, you know, it, that, that mm-hmm. would be... yes. Yeah. So some things matter. Some things and do. Some things matter more than others. I agree with that completely. If it all sounds contradictory to you, and that people are contradictions, and I, then I, and I, under, I understand that. But um, um, what was the thing we were talking about before the gay thing? Apathy or shame? Apathy or shame? Chill out. Are you happy? No, you were talking about, you know, you were reading from the book and you were talking about my worldview about politics. Oh, a bureaucratic band-aid. It's not as though a bureaucratic band-aid is going to heal the deep contradictory rifts and the cruelty. So it's like people think that... That's my favorite line in the book. That's my favorite section in the book. That's my favorite paragraph in the book. That's where it all comes together for me. I'm not joking. Yeah. So it's that people think that politics are going to heal their emotional selves. And that if, if, if the right politician were in charge, they would be... Absurd. It's absurd. I, I do. I feel that's absurd. I do. I feel that's crazy. That's just me. I don't... You know, I, I know that it's, it's just that I... Basically, and it's true, and I said that in the New Yorker uh, piece, which made me seem crazy, but I've always been an absurdist. I've always, I think the presidency is absurd. I think politicians are absurd. I think the whole notion of so much of society and the things we have to do and the, the values we have to accept are basically absurd. And I think my books are a reflection of that. And I really think the reporter who wrote about me in the New York Times, who did a great job, did not agree at all with everything I said, but she really stepped back and understood white as kind of a culmination of everything that I'd been doing artistically up until that time. She didn't agree with it, um, but she understood that that was what the book was about. And she, you know, accepted it to a degree. But I I do think that that is, um, 
you know, she got the absurdity thing, and she and and, that, and she wrote about that. She said Ellis has been an ironist and an absurdist, and that this is sort of the culmination of that. So, I don't know. I mean, what do you do when you're dealing with someone like this, in terms of that, in, in terms of looking at the world that way? Um, I get up out of bed in the morning. I like I'm in a relationship. I have plenty of work to do, but I do kind of look at the world as, as fucked up. Kind of fucked up, and then I and, and I also have to like deal with that and be a citizen within that. Yeah. Um. We have one last question, and then I'm gonna, and then I'll go to our sort of Commonwealth ending. I think we're at time almost. I don't know where, if we have a person, but um, what happened to grit to the American can-do spirit? This is a question very much. From, from another perspective, what, what happened to grit, to the American can-do spirit? Or is that the baby boomer or the silent generation? So kind of what, what happened to the value of grit and to the, to this sort of like tough American archetype that we seem to think the youth used to be? Well, you know, my grandfather, and I know this is whatever. My grandfather was 90. On Normandy, here we go. I know, oh my God, your grandfather was in World War II and he was 19 and he did all this stuff. I don't know. Sometimes I think about that generation of men and I can't help, especially now, but be kind of blown away by what they sacrificed and what they had to do compared to so many of, yes, the millennial men I know, and would they ever be able to do that? I'm dating myself, and I'm sounding quite old. I understand that. And I do think that there is something about that idea of grit, of facing the world and seeing that these problems need to be eradicated, and I've got to sacrifice, and I've got to do these things, and it might even be my life. I don't know. Sometimes when I see young men, you know, complaining about whatever, I don't even want to say safe spaces or or getting angry at college campuses about a speaker or something like that, and thinking about what would they be doing, you know, on. Uh, I don't know. I, look, it's an abstraction to me, and I don't think about this all the time, but I understand what that what that is that 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 kind of like pragmatic grit that I think you're talking about that we have to, um, you know, and I, and I do, and look, Gen X is really, look, we're as far from that great generation or the silent generation or whatever than, uh, but maybe not as much as millennials are, but it, it, it is, there's something about that, that, that is attractive to me, that notion that, um, uh, that hopefully that that is somewhere still out there. That notion of grit, which I think you, you mean, what, like a, like a kind of like brave, can-do spirit? Resilience I guess it gets redefined. Happens. I guess redefined. I mean, I'm sure there are, well, maybe it doesn't get redefined. I don't know. I don't know what it means uh, to Todd. Is it, uh, are we in this just sort of slide towards decadence and infighting and triggers and all of this? That's, or do you see things that might pull back from that like in, in sort of your worldview is there a fix is there a way to well there's never really a fix um but uh i don't know i mean things do you believe that things are uh cyclical that the, the, the i mean cyclical do you think that things come in cycles and that it's maybe this way now but it's going to be something else later and that i used to think we were on like a linear trajectory of constant progress and then okay so who did i say it fuck <laughs> i want to i want to change I, that answer <laughs> <laughs> i just realized that's why i was zoning out this is where we're going. i don't i'm asking think, for your one okay, solution so mary <laughs> okay i no i would keep who i fuck and i would Brett. change Mar oh no no actually no i'd keep them You're all the same so okay bad. i'm sorry <laughs> You're so bad. Okay, okay. Um, okay, Where there's a Commonwealth tradition. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it's not weird. It's not? No, this is the new San Francisco. It's okay. all very, like... Um, 
Um, okay, now it is an informed tradition to ask all speakers the following question. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah. You got 60 uh, seconds, and you can't go back to marry, fuck, kill. Oh, man. Um, uh, like, how to, like, change the world, like, in a positive way? <laughs> Honestly, like, in any way that you would like to change it. Um, Most people go positive, yeah, though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, can't they just, like, blow it all up? <laughs> like, can't they just get rid of everybody? This is all a mess. Um, okay. Like we need like a Noah's Ark sort of oh, moment. Oh, what? What do I think is, um, can I have that thing that they have on that, that special caller? <laughs> you cannot the call Todd. No. Can I have that? What is it? No. <laughs> what is it? No. This. <laughs> no, no calling Todd. Um. Guys, I don't know. I mean, I just not. I don't know. I don't know. I really hate to end the the show on that note, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody have any ideas? Chill out. Chill out. Yeah, everyone, chill out. That's it. Chill out, not be so angry. That's, that's it's exactly, that's what I just wrote a book about. <laughs> oh my Thank God. Thank you to author Brett Easton Ellis for joining us here at Inforum at the Commonwealth Club tonight. Thank you, Nellie. <laughs> Thank you. <And laughs> Thank you, Brett. <laughs>